We are looking at the life of Ahab this evening. We're continuing our study through the book of 1 Kings. If you have a Bible, 1 Kings chapter 21. You know, it's amazing because you're looking at a man who up until this point was the most wicked king in the nation of Israel. And yet God had given him every opportunity to repent. Opportunity after opportunity, man. God is continuing to try to get, the, get a hold of the heart of this man, Ahab. For he represented the nation of Israel. And God had, at this point, man, had continued to show him favor in spite of all of the evil that he had done. If you remember last week in chapter 20, Ahab had went to battle against Syria and God brought him a victory. Ahab was afraid to go to the battle and God said, you know what, Ahab, I'm going to deliver you, you know, and just with a a few thousand men, 7,200 and some men are going to defeat the whole army of Syria and those who would come with Syria. And God brought an incredible victory and he, he was pursuing the king of Syria. The king of Syria is hiding. And his thought was, you know what, the kings of Israel, they're so merciful. Maybe if you go and make a, you know, some kind of treaty with them, you come and you know, offer him something, that maybe he'll spare your life. And sure enough, he comes and says, Ahab, you know what, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I want to I make a treaty with you. I'll let you, I'll, you know, I'll allow you to set up camp you know, in our nation so that you can become wealthy. And here's what will happen, man. We'll, we'll become brothers. And Ahab says, hey, it sounds good to me. And he makes a treaty with Syria. And then God sends a prophet to go and talk to him. He says, you know what, Ahab, I delivered this man into your hands and you let him go. And because you didn't do what I had asked you to do and you didn't finish the task that had set before you, you know what, you gave your life, you spared his life, but now you're going to have to give your life. And it's incredible because God, you know, again, is giving Ahab another opportunity. It tells us in verse 42, watch what happens in verse 42 and verse 43 of chapter 20. He said to him, thus says the Lord, because you have let slip out of your hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore your life shall go for his life and your people for his people. So the king of Israel went to his house sullen and displeased and he came to Samaria. That's where he left off. And it didn't take much time for Ahab to forget the rebuke that he had received from one of the prophets. Because now he's sitting at home in chapter 21 and he's going to go to the house of Naboth, the Jezreelite. And he's going to want to take his land, you know, for himself. His greed. Notice the chapter, as we begin here in verse 1 of chapter 21, it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth saying, give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it is near next to my house for it will, I will give you a vineyard better than it Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth and money. Now he comes and said, look, you know, it's very convenient. If I were to have your piece of land, here's what will happen. I'll be able to have my little garden right next to me. I'll be able to go out there and grow my little vegetables and have my carrots and tomatoes. And it'd be really convenient for me if I had that piece of land. And I want you to sell it to me or I'll I'll do an exchange with you. And Naboth, it's incredible because notice Naboth's response. Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give you, watch this, the inheritance of my father to you. Now this was significant. Because you're thinking, you know, the king came in and he asked, you know, I'll give you another piece of land. I'll give you a better piece of land. I'll give you more land. But here's what I want you to do. Give me your land. And he says, look, I, it's not that I don't want to. It's that I have to obey the commandments that God had established. 
What do you mean they obey the commandments? It was back in the book of Numbers, chapter 36 and verse 7. This is what God had told Moses as they were going into the promised land. He says, so the inheritance of the children of Israel shall not change hands from one tribe to another. For every one of the children of Israel shall keep the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. And then in Leviticus 25 in verse 23, it says, The land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the land of your possessions, you shall, not re- you, you shall grant redemption of the land. For if one of your brothers becomes poor and has sold you some of his possessions, and if he is redeemed, redeeming relatives, comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what his brother sold. And here was the idea. As God had given a piece of land to someone, it was really something something that was on loan to them from God. And if they went and sold their inheritance, they were in rebellion to what God had already established. And I loved it that, you know, you got a man, Naboth here. Naboth says, you know what? I can't sell you my land. I don't care if you're the king. I don't care if you know who you are. I don't care what you're willing to give me in exchange for it, whether it's money or whether it's more land. I cannot sell it because then I would be in disobedience to God. That's commendable. When you have someone that's willing to stand because they have a conviction of what God has declared in their life, you know, you have to look at that person and say, man, that person deserves my respect and my, you know, my, my honor. And as you look at Naboth here, he's trying to undermine because he didn't care about God. He didn't care about what God had declared. He didn't care about what God has established. And so he, you know, it, I'm sorry, Ahab, Naboth cared. Ahab didn't care. And so notice what happens in verse 4. So Ahab went into his house, sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth, the Jezreelite, had spoken to him. And he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my father. And he lay down on his bed. He turned his face and he would not eat food. And he cried like a baby. No, I don't say that. (laughs) But he did. (laughs) He says, no, that's just, you know, I want that piece of land. I can't believe he's not going to give it to me. And he, he was staring at the wall. Like a little, you know, you ever had a teenager that's mad? Pouting. And he was pouting, you know, just crying. I can't believe, you know, he's not going to sell it to me. I, you know, well, what? It's just, it's not fair. It's not good. You know, think about it. He's got everything. He's the king. He's got wealth. He's got, you know, anything at his own disposal. And yet, because he couldn't get that one piece of land, man, he's, he's there, you know, pouting away. And then what happens is his wife comes in and she sees him pouting. And his wife wasn't just any woman. His wife was Jezebel. Now let me just tell you, you you ever have a little girl, please do not name her Jezebel. Because this lady is a witch. I'm sorry. I just offended every witch. (laughs) Because she was beyond. I mean, you you look at Jezebel, it's like, man, this woman was, uh, watch, we're going to find out a little bit about Jezebel. Look at verse 5. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and she said to him, Why is your spirit so sullen that you shouldn't eat no food? And he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite. And he said, And said to him, Give me your your vineyard for money, or else, if it pleases you, I'll give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Then Jezebel, his wife, said to him, You now exercise authority over Israel. Arise and eat your food and let your heart be cheerful. I'll give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. And she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, sent them letters to the elders of the nobles who were dwelling in the city of Naboth. And she wrote in the letter saying, proclaim a fast and set Naboth with high honor among the people and set two men scoundrels before him. To bear witness against him, saying, You have blasphemed God and the king. 
Then take him out and stone him that he may die. So the men of the city, the elders and nobles who were inhabiting, inhabitants of the city did as Jezebel had sent to them. And it was written in the letter which she had sent to them. They proclaimed the fast. They seated Naboth in the high honor among the people. And the two men, scoundrels, came in and they sat before him. And the scoundrels witnessed against him, against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth has blasphemed God and the king. And they took him outside the city and they stoned him with stones so that he died. Wow. What, what, a, what a dirty plot. Because Jezebel comes and she sets up this whole scenario. We'll go and tell everybody, you know, dishonor him. Let's put him on the front of the sea. We'll tell everybody what an awesome guy he is. And then we'll have a couple of scoundrels come in and they'll make false witness against him and they'll die. And, you know, you ever ask the question, like, how do evil people get away with their sin? I often ask that. God, why does it seem like the evil people win and sometimes those that are obedient to you seem to lose? You know, I'm serving the Lord. I'm doing the things that you asked me to do. And it seems like those who don't care about you, man, always seem to prevail. One of the psalmists in Psalm 73, let me ask you to turn there real quick. Psalm 73. He asked the very same question. Check this out. Psalm 73, verse 1. It says, truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled and my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than a heart could wish. They scoff and they speak wickedly concerning the oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore, his people return here and waters are of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And there's no knowledge in the Most High. Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches and surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and I've washed my hands in innocence for all day long. I have been plagued and chastened every morning. Do you ever relate to the psalmist here? It's kind of feel like, why is it, man, that, you know, I'm just trying to be, you know, good and righteous and follow the Lord, and yet it seems like the wicked people, man, always come out on top. And the psalmist, you know, and you look, you look at Ahab, and you look at that, you go, why would God allow Ahab, you know, to, to overcome this man who really, you know, had a pure heart, Naboth? And it's interesting because when you come to this part of the psalm, it begins to change. Notice, notice what happens still in Psalm 73. He says, if I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand it, it was too painful for me. Because, you know, I, just, I couldn't figure it out. And, I, and every time I said and pondered it, it just didn't make sense. And it was too painful for me. And then look at verse 17, until... I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors as a dream when one awakes. So, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. And notice how the psalmist Conclude. He says, you know what? I thought they were getting over until I went into the house of the Lord. And I went into the house of the Lord. I realized that, you know what? They're the ones that are going to have to stand before God one day. And they're the ones who are going to have a judgment before the God of heaven. And I think it's important for you and I to remember that. You know what? You, 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 can, you can have your whole life of ease while you're here. 
But if you're going to live a wicked life in, in that ease, let me tell you something, you're good, one day you're going to have to give an account for it. You will stand before God. And I wouldn't want to be in your shoes on that day. And it's incredible because the psalmist, you know, I think he, he says, look, I, if I wasn't telling you how I really felt, I, would be, I wouldn't be truthful with you. That's how I felt. But it's important that we come where? We come into the house of the Lord and we change our perspective and we remember, you know what? God's the one who's on the throne. No one gets away with their sin. No one gets away with their wickedness. One day they will have to stand before God and give an account for their life, man. And I would rather live a life man, of great, you know, trial and tribulation and stand before the Lord and hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, then rather than live a life of ease and then hear, you know what? You are not welcome in heaven. And it's incredible because you have this whole picture here of so many people, man, that, you know, they leave their, you know, they're, they're successful, they, they got wealth, they got everything going for them, and yet, man, I feel sorry for them. I feel sorry for them. Because they think they got everything, man. They'll never have the opportunity to transform their life and to change their life because of the ease that they've been given. The blessings they've been given have become a curse to them. And it's incredible because, you know, you look at th this whole picture, you've got this man who's, gonna, who's stoned to death. Because he didn't want to compromise his faith. Because he wasn't willing to give the king what he desired, you know, his land. And so what happens, they don't only kill him, but they kill his sons too. We find that out when you get to Second Chronicles. They kill, they, they, they kill Naboth, they killed his boys, and then here comes Jezebel. She comes back in the house, she goes, hey, it's all done. You can have the land now. What a sweet wife. Watch this. Verse 15. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise and take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive, but he's dead. And so it was when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab got up, he went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. And he thought, you know, it's all cool now. I got my vineyard. You know, he's all, he, he's all, he's all, excited about this new possession. He's got the land. He's going to be able to plant his carrots now. Have his little garden now. And then, man, look at verse 17. The word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, Arise and go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is in the vineyard of Naboth where he has gone down to take possession of it. And you shall speak to him saying, Thus says the Lord. Have you murdered and also taken possession? You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. What, what, that's a great way to have an introduction, huh? Hey, there you are, Ahab. Let me tell you something, man. God sent me to give you a little message. The very place they licked the blood of Naboth, they're going to lick your blood. <laughs> And notice the response. Ahab said to Elijah, have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I found you because you've sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Wow. What a, what a sad commentary when you call Elijah the prophet your enemy. Think about that. You know, when you're an enemy of the people that are standing with God, think about what your position is. When you have the people that are trying to, you know, not waver in their walk and you go and you say, you know what, you're my enemy. And how many people in our culture today, man, are considering themselves the enemy of the church? That's heavy. 
It's heavy because that's what's going on. There's a, there's a culture war going on and there's those that want to eliminate, man, those people who put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Think about their end and their pursuits. Because in reality, they don't care about the Lord. I, you know, you look at Ahab, you just like, what, 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 what a creep. Not only did he not have any leadership skills, his wife is the one running the household. Jezebel, you, you know, stop being a crybaby. I'll go at the land for you. And then she gives him the land, and then all of a sudden, man, you know, here comes the prophet Elijah, and Elijah says to her, you know what? You are going to have a horrible death because of what you've done. And notice that God blamed Ahab for what Jezebel did because even though Ahab didn't do it, it was Ahab's responsibility to be the head of his home. Interesting. That was his God-given role was to be the leader of his home. And even though Jezebel was making all the decisions, God's holding Ahab accountable for the decisions that his wife was making because he didn't do what God instructed him to do. As it says something to us as men, right? Man, you're gonna stand before God and give an account for your household, man. No matter you know, what your wife does, you are the one who's been given the responsibility. If she's making the decisions, you give an account for them. Heavy. And it's incredible because, you know, you look at, you look at this picture and, and notice, notice what happens. Ahab says, you know, you're my enemy. You found me. And then he says, let me tell you what, you've done evil in the sight of the Lord. God sees it. You might not think that God's watching, but God's watching. And he knows everything that happened, Ahab. And he knows exactly how all this went down. And look what he says in verse 21. Behold, I'll bring calamity on you. I will take away your posterity. I will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both bond and free. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation which you have provoked me to anger and you made Israel sin. And concerning Jezebel, the Lord also spoke, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. And the dog shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city, and the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. But there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord, because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. Wow. Jezebel provoked her husband to sin. She stirred him up. Remember, he married a, a woman who was in part of Israel. She had all of her other idols and he made a, 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 a covenant with her in marriage. Which he was warned about. Don't, you know, in the Old Testament, they were told they're not, they're not to marry someone of, 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 you know, that has a different God. In the New Testament, we're told not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has light with darkness and what fellowship has, has good with evil, right? And you look at this whole picture and Jezebel stirred up her husband to do evil. And, and he, he was a willful player. He went right along with it, you know, in all of his immorality, all of his wickedness. And it's, it's incredible that, you know, they, they made a team that continued to pursue wickedness, man, their whole life. Now, you look at this whole situation, you go, man, you know, how, you know, how, how much worse can it get? Look, look, look at verse 26. And he behaved very abominably in following idols according to all the Amorites had done whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel and so it was when Ahab heard those words watch this he tore his clothes he put on sackcloth on his body 
He fasted and he laid in sackcloth and he went out about mourning. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, see how Ahab has humbled himself before me. Because he's humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamities in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house. Wow. The mercy of God, it blows my mind. That God is so gracious. Even to the point where, you know, God has said, you know what, you're, you're going you're gonna to suffer the consequences of your sin. And Ahab, somewhere along the road here, you know, comes to this place where he finally realizes, you know what, what I'm doing is wrong in the eyes of God. What, I, what I'm doing is, is, you know, evil. And it says that he put on sackcloth was a sign of repentance and mourning. He tars his clothes. And he begins to humble himself before the Lord, fasted and mourned. This is what amazes me about God. You know how gracious he is when a person finally comes to this place where he says, God, I blew it. I'm sorry. And I look at this whole thing, you know, think of how many chances has Ahab already had? And yet God is still there with, you know, with open arms waiting for him to make things right between him and God. And I thank God that he is that gracious. Because I know, man, I don't deserve God's mercy and God's grace. I know I made promises after promise after promise, and then I went right back into my sin. Man, every time I was in trouble, I would call out to God, and God would rescue me. And then as soon as I was out of trouble, I would run right back to my old life. And you would think, you know, God would say, you know what, that's it, buddy. You had enough chances already. I've been so gracious to you, you know, and yet you continue to rebel against me. You know, you know forget it. And yet, that's never the heart of God. It's never the heart of God. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the heart of God. God doesn't want to see anybody in hell. God doesn't want to see anybody in, you know, in a place of, of total hopelessness. If you've rebelled against God, then all it takes is for you to bend your knee and say, God, I'm wrong. You're right. Change me. That's God. It's not me, because I would have been like, forget you, Ahab. Let's get the dogs lined up. Who let the dogs out, right? I mean, I would have been, I would have been singing. But that's not God's heart. And you realize, you know, in this whole situation that, you know, Ahab now has another opportunity to do things right. And the sad thing is, is that Ahab still, he only had a superficial repentance. It wasn't a godly sorrow, but it was a sorrow that would only, you know, was a show for people to see. It's a sad place. Notice chapter 22. We're going we're gonna to get halfway through chapter 22. Watch what he says. Now three years had passed without war between Syria and Israel. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went down to visit the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said to his servant, Do you know that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, but we hesitate to take it out of the hand of the king of Syria? So he said to Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to fight at Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I will go. Uh, or he said, I am as you are. My people are your people. My horses as your horses. Now, now th- let me just stop here. Jehoshaphat, we, we, we're, we're going to come to him shortly. We'll spend more time. When we get to Second Chronicles, we'll look at Jehoshaphat as an incredible man of God. 
he had, he had, he, he's gonna, we're gonna look at Jehoshaphat's life and next week we'll, we'll take a little, a little dabble into it because there's so much here that, you know, we can look at the life of Jehoshaphat. But one of the things you look at is Jehoshaphat feared God, he loved God, and yet he's making a covenant with Ahab, who was not a godly man. And you look at what, why, what's going on with Jehoshaphat. Here, here's an interesting picture is that Jehoram, the son of Jeho- Jehoshaphat, had married Athelia, the daughter of Ahab, and Jezebel. And so what had happened is they had become intertwined by marriage. That was his daughter-in-law. Right there, there was there was now a, a relationship between you know the grandkids. I mean, you know, you you got this whole now this whole loyalty that was taking place, and it's and it's a sad picture here because Jehoshaphat was willing to compromise because of a relationship that he had with his daughter and with his grandkids. And it's a sad thing, you know, when someone is willing to compromise their faith, man, because of, some, because of a relationship they have. And, you know, we all have to wrestle with that. You know, you, you got your kids and, you know, your kids go off and they're, they're living, you know, immoral lifestyles. And we have to wrestle like, okay, man, where do I draw the lines? And, you know, how, how is my relationship with them if they're going to, you know, rebel against God? And it's never, you know, the opportunity for you to compromise your faith no matter what anybody else does. It's never, you know, the right thing to do when you go, you know what, well, you know, it's my kid, so I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to do anything. Or I'm not going to say, no, you still stand for righteousness. And Jehoshaphat, it's crazy because Jehoshaphat compromised because of the relationship. And our, you know, we've been called to have our loyalty to God above everything else. And yet he's going to go make a covenant. He goes, hey, your people like my people, you know. And like, no, you're not. These, you, you, this people serve the Lord. These guys are all into idolatry. They're not the same. Your people are my like people. Maybe these horses are like their horses, I guess. But it definitely wasn't your people like my people because they had two different priorities. They had two different pursuits. They had two different, you know, two different gods. And yet Jehoshaphat's willing to make a covenant with them. Now notice what happens in verse 5. And Jehoshaphat said, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, please inquire for the word of the Lord today. And the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and he said to them, shall I go up against Ramoth Gilead to fight or shall I refrain? And they said, go up, for the Lord will deliver you into the hand, deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, hey, is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that he, we may inquire of him? Did you notice in your Bible, there's the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's speaking of Jehovah. He's speaking of Yahweh. He's talking about the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He gathered, for some reason, he, he, the, you look at Ahab, he's always got 400 prophets, but these aren't prophets of the Lord. That was, you know, capital L, little O-R-D, which was, you know, the gods of this world, the gods of the different tribes, the lords, not the God of Israel. And he gathers these foreign prophets together and he says, hey, you know what, should we go up against the Lord, you know, against the, the, this enemy here, Ramoth Gilead? Should we fight against them? Oh yeah, go ahead and go up. You guys will have great victory. And Joseph goes, wait a second, you know, I... I I I don't care about these guys. I I want a prophet of the Lord to be inquired of. So you look at Jehoshaphat, you know, even in this situation, he, he still had some, you know, some clarity to him. I don't care what, what all, all, you know, your prophets say. I, I, I want one of God's prophets to, you know, bring clarity in the situation. Notice what happens. He says, so the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there's still one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him 
because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehovah said, said let not the king say such things. <laughs> Because, you know, there, there is one more guy, Micaiah, you know what? But every time I ask him something, he always says something bad. So I don't want to ask him anymore. I just want to hear good. Let me tell you something. If you're, if you're going to a prophet and all he's telling you is good, then you're, you've got the wrong prophet. <laughs> if someone's not willing to tell you truth, they just want to tickle your ear. And let me tell you, one of the most pop- some of the most popular teachers in our culture right now, they're only going to tell you what you want to hear. They'll tickle your ear all day long. Oh, God just wants you to be happy and wealthy, and God wants you to have a big house and a big car. And, he wants, you know, and, and they'll just tell you everything that your flesh wants to hear so that what? They got you, you know, now listening to them so that they can become prosperous as they promise you prosperity. If you send in your money, man, you know, I'll just keep telling you everything you want to hear. And then the reality is they're the ones getting rich. (laughs) And what's incredible is you look at this whole picture, you know, these guys are going, hey, just go ahead and go to the battle. God's going to be with you. He goes, hey, you know, I want to hear, I want to hear truth. I want to hear someone's going to tell me the reality of what's going on rather than just have someone tell me what I want to hear. And I pray, you know, every one of us would have that same heart, man. You know what? I want to hear truth in my life. I don't want someone just to tell me what I want to hear. Be honest with me. What does God say? What does God declare? You know, what does God's word declare? Because if now I know truth, then I can make quality decisions for my life. I'm not living in deception or in error. I'm living with, you know, someone who's going to be candid with me. Now, watch, watch this. I, I, I love Micaiah. What a great prophet. And the king of Israel, verse 9, the king of Israel called an officer and he said, Bring Micaiah, the son of Imla, quickly. And the king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, having put on their robes, sat each on his throne at a threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. Then Zedekiah, the son of Cheniah, had made horns of iron for himself, and he said, Thus says the Lord, with these you shall gore the Syrians until they were destroyed. Now, it's one thing to have a, a lying prophet, but now you got a lying prophet with props. Not good. He wouldn't have someone make horns. <laughs> he goes, this is what you're going to do. You know, yeah, you guys are going to, and they gave him this whole, you know, this whole acting spiel. You guys are going to destroy the Syrians. And, you know, and, and they, they were just, you know, again, just pumping them up. Telling them, you know, everything's good. You don't have to repent. You don't have to get right with it. You know, God's just going to bless you. It doesn't matter. And, you know, it, it's, it, it's crazy because watch this. And so... With these you shall gore the Syrians. Look at verse 12. And all the prophets prophesied, so saying, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will bless, deliver it into the king's hands. And the messenger who had gone to call Micaiah spoke to him, saying, now listen. Micaiah, let, let, let's be reasonable here. The words of the prophets with one accord encouraged the king, please let your words be like the words of one of them and speak encouragement. You know, don't say anything that's going to offend the kings. Just speak encouraging words. And then, watch this, Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. Wow, that, that's, that's a true man of God right there. I'm not here to to tell you what you want to hear. I'm here to tell you what God wants you to hear. And whatever God tells me, that's what I'm going to tell him. You know, I mean, I I love this guy, you know, because I think he becomes a model, especially for the days we're living in. A model prophet, a model man that, that, that fears God. You know what? I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear, even though, you know, it might hurt you. It might offend you. I might step on your toes. You might never want to come back again, so be it. But let me tell you, I'm going to tell you what you need to hear because I'm going to tell you what God said. I love it. 
It takes more courage to speak truth than it is to speak lies. It takes more courage to stand up, man, when no one wants to hear what you, want to, what you gotta say because God is bringing a judgment upon someone than to tell them, you know what, everything's gonna be wonderful. And Micaiah, man, he says, you know what, all I'm gonna do, I'm gonna tell you what God said and the rest is on you, man. You do with it whatever you want. Notice verse 15. So he came to the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall we refrain? And he answered, go and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. I, I think he was being sarcastic. <laughs> yeah, just go, you guys, you guys will be awesome, it'll be great. <laughs> and the king said to him, how many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? I, 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 think, I think Micaiah was messing with him. I'm convinced of it. Because he goes, you know what? You, 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 you sent your guys over there to tell me to tell you what you want to hear. You want to tell you what you want to hear? I'll tell you what you want to hear. And he said it in a way that they knew he wasn't being candid with them. Tell me the truth, Micaiah. What, is, you know, what did the Lord say? And then watch this. And he said... I saw all of Israel scattered on the mountain as a sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said, Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you he would not pro prophesy good concerning me, but evil? <laughs> tell me the truth. Okay, you want the truth? I'll tell you the truth. See, I told you he wasn't going to tell you. Know, he was going to be favorable. You know, and he starts crying again. Ahab was a good crybaby. Because every time you know, he would, you know, he didn't get his way, he would just begin to pout and complain. And, and he says, you know what I told you? You know, he wasn't going to you know, tell us what we wanted to hear. I knew, I knew it. I knew it from the beginning. And then watch Micaiah. Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. And all the hosts of heaven standing by on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in the manner and another spoke in that manner. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said to him, in what way? And he said, I will go out and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. What a picture. Because what, what Micaiah says, let me tell you what's going on, man. All of these guys are persuading you to go out there because God wants to take you out. And then, you know, you look at that whole picture, this is a lying spirit. That means that this was demonic. And you have to ask the question, well, wait a second, the demonic forces are there listening to God. Let me tell you something, God's in control of everything. He's in control of everything. Nothing can happen unless God allows it to happen, and even the demons are subject to him. Wow. Wow. And that should be, you know, for every one of us, it should be something you go, man, you know what? I can, I can live my life, I can do, live my life for the kingdom of heaven. And you know what? The devil has no power over my life and all of his lies have no power over my life. And God's the one who's in control of everything. And if God allows something to happen, man, it's because he has a plan in the middle of it. Both good and evil. He's in control. He, he's the one who can stop the devil or he's the one that allows the devil. The devil can do nothing without permission from the Lord. That's heavy. Because you realize, you know, we're living in a world where all of this evil is, you know, rampant. We're watching, you know, all of this, the lies, the, the enemy. We're, we're watching, you know, deception take place. I can't, I'm talking to people. I can't even believe the lies that they're believing. It's incredible. Talking to so many kids who believe that socialism is going to be something good for our nation, when in reality, it's going to destroy our nation. 
Because they've been, they've been, you know, programmed and they've been lied to. And you wonder, man, how much of this, man, is God allowing? Because we're about to, you know, God's, God's judgment's about to fall upon our nation. Heavy. Heavy. And even though all of that is there, man, God still is waiting for those who are willing to repent. Because God will forgive, man, anyone who humbles himself and comes and said, God, I'm wrong. You're right. That's the mercy of God. And you have this whole scene. He tells, let me tell you what's going on in heaven, man. You know, God spoke to me. This is what God showed me. And all of, you know, we're going to persuade Ahab to go into the battle. And he goes, how are you going to do it? And all of these, you know, different ideas came up. And he said, you know what? You got the best idea. You go get the 400 prophets. They're going to persuade him to go into the battle. And yet this is where he's going to be taken out. And we find the demise of Ahab take place here is his life is going to be destroyed. Watch this. Verse 22, or verse 23, Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all of these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. Now Zedekiah, the son of Chenaniah, went near, and he struck Micaiah on the cheek, and he said, Which way did the spirit come from the Lord? Go from me to speak to you. You know, they're mocking them. Oh, you think you're so spiritual. Tell me, tell me when I punch you in the nose, you know, what spirit was that? You know, and they're, they're going to, you know, let me tell you something. You're going to stand for the Lord. The world's going to mock you. you. If you don't come to terms with that, then, man, you know, you're in for a rude awakening. <laughs> your friends, even your own family, even your own husband, even your own wife, even your own, your own kids. I mean, you know, if you're going to stand for the Lord, man, let me tell you, the world doesn't understand because they don't know him. And Micaiah, you know, stands there. He's going to tell the truth. And then one of the, one of the servants of, of, of Ahab comes up, you know, and slaps him upside the head. And he says, oh, tell me, where did the spirit come from there, buddy? Well, that's all right. You got yours coming, buddy. <laughs> the Lord's going to get you. Watch this. Verse 25, and Micaiah said, indeed, you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide. So the king of Israel said, take Micaiah, return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, thus says the king, put this fellow in prison and feed him with bread of affliction and the water of affliction until I come in peace. And Micaiah said, if you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, take heed, all you people. Wow. I, I, you know, you, you, gotta lo- you gotta love the courage of Micaiah. Because Micaiah was willing, you know, to speak on behalf of God in spite of the consequence that would come toward him. Because you know what? Because you said those things, we're going to take you. We're going to put you into prison. You're going to eat bread and water until the day we come back in. And he says, let me tell you something. You're not coming back, buddy. You're not coming back. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to die. And if you don't die out on the battlefield, then I'm a false prophet, man. (laughs) If somebody speaks a prophecy and their prophecy doesn't come to pass, they're a false prophet. That's why you got to be careful, man, who you listen to and who you put, you know, you, you, you heed. Because if someone's going to speak something that doesn't come to pass, the first time it happens, you know, you know what? This person has not heard from the Lord, man. So that's just heavy. It's a big responsibility to speak on behalf of God. In the Old Testament, if someone said a false prophecy, they'd take them outside the city gates and they would stone them to death. There'd be a lot of stone prophets right now if we held the same standards. I know for me, you know, I listen to someone, they give a prophecy and that prophecy doesn't come to pass. You know what? You lost credibility, man. I could never trust you again because if you are going to speak on behalf of God and then you're going to deceive, man, that is something that, you know, is disqualifying. And Micaiah understood that. 
It's interesting, you know, and, and we don't got time to get into the next battle and, and we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up next week. We'll finish the book of, of, of First Kings and we'll start Second Kings the week after. But let me ask you to turn, go to Jeremiah chapter 23. Man, what an incredible, incredible chapter. We'll wrap it up right here. Jeremiah chapter 23. It's an interesting passage because in Jeremiah chapter 23, there were a lot of false prophets that were prophesying. And what they were prophesying, see, God had said, and Jeremiah was the last prophet before the children of Israel were taken into captivity to Babylon. And all of the prophets were saying, you know what, no, you know, God's not going to allow you guys to be taken to captivity. Just keep doing everything like you're doing. You know, God's going to deliver you guys. And even though the enemy was already surrounding Jerusalem, they were still saying, you know what, God's going to bring deliverance. Don't worry about it. And Jeremiah kept saying, you know what, God's going to bring judgment upon you guys. Notice in verse 16 of chapter 23. And the Lord, thus says the Lord of hosts, Jeremiah speaking, do not listen to the words of these prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak visions of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. They continually say to these people who despise me, the Lord said, you shall have peace. And to everyone who walks according to the dictates of his own heart, they say, no evil shall come upon you. For who has stood in the counsel of the Lord? And who has perceived and heard his word? Who has marked his word and he's heard it? With, with, behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, a violent whirlwind. I will fall violently on the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed, performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it perfectly. Incredible. He says, you know what? The, the, these guys are telling you visions of their own heart, but they're not telling you what God's word declares. And that's exactly what was happening to Ahab. And, you know, Ahab had bought into all of these lies because no one would speak truth to him. And then when truth finally comes to him, he, he rejects that truth. And then notice the next verse, man. And this passage always, man, is blowing my mind because watch what he says here. I have not sent these prophets, but they ran. I have not spoken to them, but they prophesied. Watch this. But if they had stood in my counsel and they had caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned from their evil way and from the evil of their doing. And this is what God is telling, ta- ta- you know, Jeremiah, as God is speaking to Jeremiah to all of, of, of these false prophets and to all the nation of Israel. He said, you know what? Even though I didn't send them, even though I didn't tell them anything, if they would have just given my word, then the people would have had an opportunity to repent. And the word of God is living and it's powerful. And the Bible says this, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts between the bone and the marrow, between the soul and the spirit, and it's a discerner of the intents and the thoughts of the heart. Because God's word is what's able to bring a person to a place where they acknowledge, I'm wrong, man, I'm guilty before God. And this is what's cool, man, is the word of God goes forth, the spirit of God comes into a person's life, and it says he convicts a person of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. It's the Holy Spirit that brings conviction into a person's life. I can't, I can't save someone, man. I don't have the ability to save someone. It's gotta be the Holy Spirit convicting someone so that that person hears God's word and they go, man, wait a second, that's truth. What that, what that guy is saying is not his opinion. This is what God says. And what happens is that they now are convicted because they know that they're sinners. And they also understand this. Because of their sin, they can never enter into God's presence. The only way a man or woman could ever come into God's presence is if the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to their life, to their account. 
You're not good enough. I'm not good enough. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. But Jesus came into this world, man, to wash you from your sin and to place his righteousness into your account so you can be made righteous in the eyes of God. And he says, you'll be convicted that judgment is coming. And anyone who doesn't have the righteousness of Jesus Christ, judgment will come upon that person's life one day. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how, you know, how many things you've done for the needy or the poor, how much money you gave away. That's not what makes you righteous, man. It's only the blood of Jesus Christ that makes you righteous. And as you put your faith in Jesus Christ because you hear truth, you know what? I'm guilty before God. I realize I'm a sinner and I need to ask God to cleanse me and forgive me. And then as you ask him, man, the Bible says that God is faithful and just to forgive you for all unrighteousness, for all wickedness. He did it for Ahab and yet Ahab didn't, you know, respond. And this was the most wicked king that ever lived on the face of the earth. And if God can forgive Ahab, man, he can surely forgive you and forgive me. If we would just humble ourselves, man, and we would acknowledge, you know what, man, I'm guilty before God. And the only way you come to that place is if the Holy Spirit is revealing that to you. I need God's grace and God's forgiveness. And I need God's spirit to live inside of me so that he can begin to guide my life and direct my life.